Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of What's on My Desk. Surprisingly, today I only have one watch, and it's a Breitling. So why did I bring the one Breitling on my show to talk about the Super Ocean Chronograph? Uh, well, because I actually wanted to talk about Breitling. A lot of you guys have asked me, why is Breitling not getting any love? Well, uh, today I'm going to show a lot of love to Breitling because I want to talk to you about Breitling its history, and that, which is why I brought the single watch on here. 1884 is when this company started. Leon, or Leon, or Leon Breitling, as we would pronounce it here in America, was a skilled watchmaker that crafted both timepieces and intelligent measuring tools. And Breitling has always been, going back to its very, very beginning, about chronographs. If you think of Breitling, if you know Breitling and its history, the first thing that will pop into your head is chronographs, chronographs, chronographs. During the time, there was an increased demand for chronographs, old measuring tools, when you're talking about application across industrial, military, and scientific applications, if you will. And of course, let's not forget athletic organizations as well, right? Didn't have computers back then, nor did you have iPhones. So you needed to use something to measure time lapsed. And a lot of those industries had a big need for that. And the biggest need was for accuracy and convenience of use. 1889, Mr. Breitling was actually granted a patent for a simplified chronograph, which was a pocket watch. And what separated from the most is the sleek, simple design, as well as the low maintenance of the timepiece. A lot of awards followed. They established a huge reputation, which prompted them to move in Le Chou de Fonds. Don't kill the pronunciation. In 1892, I believe is what it was. A big deal back then in 1893 is when they patented a chronograph that had an astounding eight-day power reserve. It was a model that had the pulsograph which was ideal for measuring a patient's pulse rate. So, as you can imagine, there was a lot of demand for those in the medical field. Early 1900s, as the automobile industry was emerging, Liam Breitling patented a simple time attackometer. It enabled the driver to calculate their speed, but it also enabled the police to do the same thing. Well, lo and behold, let's all together thank Mr. Liam Breitling for the first speeding tickets that were issued in Switzerland back then and all the way out to today. Of course, nobody's sitting there now is hiding in the bushes with a, a pocket watch like timer. That, right, nowadays they have raiders and stuff like that. But nevertheless, this is the guy that started the speeding tickets. So thank you very much, Mr. Breitling, for that. I'm sure we all feel the same. Liam Breitling passed away in 1914 and Gus Stone Breitling, which was his son, he took over the business and he wanted to show what he can do. He wanted to innovate, innovate, innovate. That's what Breitling has always been all about. As a result, in 1915, he launched one of the world's first a wrist chronographs, it was the one that had a single pusher above the crown. And interestingly enough, a lot of these earlier Breitlings, they didn't really have to carry the name Breitling on there. It wasn't until the 20s till they started putting the Breitling name onto their watches. Unfortunately, in 1927, Gaston passed away unexpectedly. His son, Willie, who was only 13 or 14 years old at the time, was way too young to sort of take over the company. But an external team took over and the company lived on. It survived the Wall Street crash, the Great Depression, which followed after. But in 1932, uh, even though as a very young man, uh, Willie felt yeah. as if he was ready to, to take on the company and continue the family's success and the family business. Chronographs were still Breitling's passion at the time, and Willie continued the tradition. Up until now, you had the one-button chronograph, and then you had the two-button chronograph that was sort of part of that crown. So obviously, in 1934, after starting to stop, and the most obvious thing followed, and that was the reset. And that's what Willie came up with. They finally came out with a chronograph that had the start, the stop, and the reset button now. And that was only the beginning. This is when Breitling got into aviation. In the early 30s, they started making those cockpit tools, which had to be extremely accurate for flight. And this is why we know Breitling to be mostly an aviator's watch till this day. The one dashboard clock that's worth noting is uh, when they established the Hewitt Aviation Department, right? Obviously with super strict requirements for military specifically. This is when Hewitt went on to uh, create the dashboard clocks with eight day power reserves as well as wristwatches and things of that nature. And the Hewitt products, they immediately attracted attention from militaries all over the world uh, in regards to their wrist instruments and their dashboard instruments. And with World War II looming at the time, Breitling immediately received a huge contract from the Royal Air Force, 
get basically gaining Willie's brand's access to some of the legendary bombers, as well as the fighter planes. Of course, 1940s, the famous Carnomat was born, which is characterized by a patented rotating slide rule used by technicians and scientists. And then in 1943, uh, that's when the Premier line was born. They made them in gold, they made them in stainless steel, they were more refined. They were now meant to be a fine timepiece rather than just an instrument, even though it was still a good instrument just the same because it was a chronograph. And then of course in 1944, they did the duograph, which was the split second chronograph. And post-war, they did the Torah line, which had its calendar and the moon phase display. They didn't stop in the 50s. The 50s was a super innovative for braiding the same. Why was it innovative? Because that's when the famous Navitimer came out. You guys are familiar with the Navitimer. This is now again a watch or an instrument that would provide timing and navigation, hence Navitimer, right? That's a pretty simple name, I guess, if you ask me. It introduced the slide-specific slide rule. Numerous pilots and aviation companies, airline and even airline manufacturers have opted for this timepiece ever since, until this day, really. Another milestone in the 50s was the watch that I have on my desk today, which is the Super Ocean, right? Willie literally made a splash with the Super Ocean. It was done for Willie's 25th anniversary as the head of Brightly, and he made a diver's watch for the case that was water resistance up to 200 meters. This guy, I think, is 550 meters, actually. Obviously, this is a much newer version. And then, of course, the trans Ocean was born building on a momentum of the super ocean. Note that all these lines exist till this day. It was shockproof, it was anti-magnetic, it was just a rugged, rugged watch. They called it super sealed, right? And the public took a huge liking to that watch because the idea was is now you have this rugged, waterproof watch with the same precision of the flight instruments that Braylon made all these years before. Astronaut Scott Carpenter redesigned a version of a Navit timer to include a 24-hour scale. Why? Because in space it was impossible to distinguish night from day, right? So very useful functionality there. He actually used the watch in 1962 aboard the Aurora 7. Not only did he design the watch, that watch actually made it into space. Now on to my favorite, Bond, James Bond. 1965, Thunderball, right? Played by Sean Connery. Q gave James Bond a very special top time watch, which was equipped with a Geiger scale, right? He was trying to locate stolen nuclear missiles on the water, blah, 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 so he was measuring radiation. Of course, that watch never really existed in person, although I would love to get my hand on that movie prop. I'm sure it's in a museum somewhere right now. I'm a big James Bond fan, so. Now, mind you, the top time was a very daring shape at the time. It was a square watch, and they later marketed this towards women, and women were buying these things up as a beautiful fashion accessory, believe it or not. So uh, what started with James Bond ended up being a popular women's watch in the mid-60s to early 70s. In 1979, shortly before his death, he sold the remaining assets along with the names to a gentleman by the name of Ernest Schneider, who was actually a very fitting buyer for the company because Ernest Schneider was a watch market and a pilot. So in a perfect world, if Breitling had to sell to someone, this would be the guy. So the company, as we know today, was registered in 1982 as Breitling Montress S.A. Under the new ownership, 84, they celebrate their 100th anniversary with the introduction of the cockpit model. Remember those bullet bracelets? This is the watch they celebrated their 100th anniversary with. The 80s was also very innovative for Breitling. They continued in path of innovation. They did the aerospace watch. And this is, this is that watch that had the digital display and the analog display. They still make them till this day, right? 1985, they, manu- they made a new manual wine navy timer, continued with tradition. And in 1988, was a big deal. This is when they came out with the emergency watch which was the first watch of its kind with an integrated emergency transmitter. Of course, it came into its own later in the 90s with introduction with the patented deploying antenna system. And then the later models, the, the transmitter that the thing comes with actually locked into the international distress uh, frequencies. If, God forbid, you crash your plane somewhere in the jungle, you can actually utilize that watch to save your life. Of course, there was more following just in time to mark their 125th anniversary. Breitling came out with their famous in-house movement, the Caliber 01, which was launched in 2010 and it was the chronospace. It was a descendant of the aerospace and it, it didn't just include time in one one hundredth of a second chronograph but it also had a digital display with an alarm, a calendar, a countdown timer, a GMT time and a second time zone along with the slide rule function so closely associated with the Breitling watches for professionals. And then of course in 2015, Exospace Exospace, Exospace, I'm not sure what the proper pronunciation of this watch is, uh, B55. That's the watch that had the smartphone capability. You can adjust all the functions of the watch via a smartphone. It's also a watch that notified you if you got emails or text messages and things of that nature, full connectivity, really. 2017 was another sale. Breitling SA was acquired. 
CVC Capital Partners. And that's when George Kern assumed position as the CEO of Brightly. And as George put it, and I quote, he already had a distinguished career in the watch industry and he looks forward to carrying on a rich tradition whose roots go all the way back to a small workshop in St. Emir in 1884. So here's a quick run through on Breitling for you guys in the history of Breitling. You guys know me, I love all things history, especially when it comes to this little mechanical wonders that we call wristwatches. Which brings me to the watch on my desk, which is a Super Ocean. There was really no particular reason I, I brought this Breitling, nor did I have a plan on actually reviewing it. I'm just gonna show you the watch, obviously. So here's the Super Ocean. I love the black, it's sort of rubberized bezel that this watch has. Uh, I love the blue markings. I love the big hour markers. The watch is extremely legible to read. Obviously the chronograph, which is what this company's legacy is all about. It's about those accurate chronographs. Watch retails for about 4,600 bucks on a secondary market. You can pick it up for about $2,000, which brings me to my next point. There are super deals out there to be had on Breitlings, a company that's rich in history because they don't price themselves high. Majority of the steel stuff is under 10,000 retail, some even under 5,000 retail. Uh, the issue with Breitling as I see it today and why, you know, value-wise they don't hold as well is because they make a lot of watches. There's so many different variations of the Super Oceans and other lines that I've mentioned to include the Navitime and the Aerospace and all those things that one can easily get lost when you go onto Breitling's website. And on top of that, each one of these models can be customized with a different bracelet, a different buckle, a different strap. Like this watch alone comes with uh, black subdials, blue subdials, white dial, black dial, uh, different bezels, different bracelets. There's just so many different things that one particular model can differ in. One might say that that's a lack of innovation or oh, someone else may say they're just sticking to their roots and they're doing what they do best and that is to make kick-ass watches not just for pilots but guys that love watches the guys that love aviation guys that love precision and guys that like chronographs i think when it comes to chronographs if you're a chronograph lover i can't think of a better brand to go with than a brightling because brightling screams history when it comes to making chronograph and accurate instruments, as I should call them. So guys, I hope this sort of fills the gap in regards to what you guys always ask me about, about featuring brightlings. I didn't per se feature a whole lot of brightlings and didn't get into many brightlings. Perhaps I'll do a, a version of a what's on my desk where I'll, I'll bring a few brightling watches in here and talk about some of the different variations. I also know a lot of guys that have a lot of vintage brightlings. Maybe I'll bring one of those guys on because I would love to be hands-on on any vintage brightling for that matter. And uh, especially, you know, some of the pictures that Ian has popped up on the screen. Those watches are actually out there and available. Lots of Breitling collectors out there. And I know a lot of vintage dealers that have them. I think uh, Cameron, right, at the IWJG show that I did, he showed a, a, a pretty kick-ass vintage Breitling. The market on vintage Breitling is not as hot as that of a Rolex market or some of the other bigger brands like Paddock or even AP, which makes it uh, better for you guys as collectors or as, as buyers out there, which means you can pick some of those older icons relatively inexpensive out there. These things to me are mechanical wonders. And when it comes to a company like Breitling with such rich history that held out for quite some time before selling to some of the bigger groups, definitely uh, music to my ear. And these instruments, as Breitling often refers to their watches, are just as near and dear to my heart as any other brand out there that I may speak about more often. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode and a little rundown memory lane with Breitling. Uh, as always, hit the like button, subscribe if you're already not a subscriber to my channel. Share this video with your friends because that's what helps my channel grow. And I'll see you guys next week for more watch reviews and other videos.